All right, what? I gotta put my radio voice back on for a second. Ryan Holiday. Jeez. We did. We just jumped into yeah, it. We did. Uh, Ryan Holiday back on the show. It's been it's been a few years since we've done this. 2017 Is that episode. When we did eight. it. Yeah. Okay. I remember. I was so excited because one, you, you already know this. Huge fan of your work. I need just mega author now. I mean, ten. How many books now? Ten. I think this is nine. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, man, it's a lot. Anyway, yeah, so we came out to so Austin. Many. We did a whole episode. I think yeah. it was right around the time Ego came out. Or in his library, I might add. Your yeah. library. Michael went and copied all your bookshelves. I did. When we got home. The, the Billy bookcase from IKEA. Yes, yes. the Billy yeah. bookcase. It's all over. <laughs> Those are extremely cost effective for anybody wanting to build a library. Yeah. <laughs> Billy yeah. bookcase, IKEA, everybody. And then there's an extender you can get on the top. Yeah. No, I was, it was well because I had all these books stacked and they looked like shit. Everyone, I was like, now I have this. You know. Mm -hmm. Thank God your man cave looks normal. Anyways, man, welcome back. I love that Thank you wore you. the Iron Maiden T-shirt. Sidebar here, I was always a Metallica guy, but I love Iron Maiden. Why? What's the what's the connection with Iron Maiden? Uh, I'm just a huge fan. I think I, I think uh, Metallica is like more blue collar to me. Okay. And then Iron Maiden's like a little bit more feels like artistic and like larger than life. They're like. I mean, there one one's a sort of the British version and one's the American version. I feel like but I've I, never got to go to an Iron Maiden show, and I need to go. I uh, love Iron Maiden. I just was always listen to Metallica. The, they're on the they're on tour right now, and uh, although Metallica was, and they just canceled it. But um, back in rehab, I think. Yeah, uh, it was the show's insane. I mean, they're like sixty five for seventy. They're, still crushing it. They're still crushing it. Uh, it was nuts. It was nuts. For I gave it a perennial seller. Of course, they're the, all, the so they. Like, I think what's interesting is, like, so Metallica is a huge band. So, like, everyone knows Metallica is a big band because they've had, like, enormous songs. You wouldn't think Iron Maiden sold 100 million records. Wow. No. Th I mean, they're massive. Yeah. No, I know that. That's that's wild. I, I don't know what it is. I think it's because I was introduced to Metallica. Yeah. It was, like, my first metal music when I was, like, maybe, like, fifth mm -hmm. or sixth grade. And so that's the one that stuck. And I didn't learn about Iron Maiden until, like, three or four years later. Yeah. But I think it's, like, the first one you... Yeah, the of connection course. With. I was trying to illegally download a Metallica song off Audio Galaxy when I was in high school, and I accidentally downloaded an Iron Maiden song, and that's how it started. Hmm. What was the song? Which one? I don't remember. I think it was Hallowed Be Thy Name. Oh, that's uh, um, a great song. Long yeah. song. Yes. All right, we could go on. Okay. We, see, we yeah, could get stuck good. on a metal tangent yeah. here for a long time. All right, Ryan, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about your new book, Stillness is the Key. But before we do, one, like I said, Lauren and I are huge fans of work. Everyone should check out Obstacles the Way, Ego's the Enemy, Growth Hacker. I mean, perennial. So we, all of them. But one that we wanted to talk about Don't with you. Don't forget the Daily Stoic. Yeah, that's okay. what we want to talk about, the Daily right. Stoic. Because both anything. of us, you know, I, I first got the Daily Stoic when you first came out. Was it in 2016? That's when it came out, yeah. Okay, and I've done this practice almost every day since then. I've bought four copies of the book now, three or four. And I read one page a day and I actually journal in the book and make some yeah. notes. It's just like a good way for me to reflect. And it's, it's interesting to see how that perspective changes each year, like going totally. back to what was going through my head in 2016. So now Lauren's done the same thing. So let, let's talk about the Daily Stoic a little bit. So I do, uh, I don't obviously journal in my own book. That would be weird. But I have a journal version mm -hmm. like, and, and I do this morning. I sit down and it has a question. And I think that's, it's a very much sort of part of my like morning ritual is like, let me let me stop and think sort of big picture, big idea, meditate on some idea that challenges me or makes me better. And I think that's what, that's not, when, when we think of philosophy, we think of sort of abstract or theoretical or, or we think of something you do in a classroom. The idea that it's this sort of daily practice, almost like prayer or, or like Bible study is not how we think about it, but that's really how it's supposed to be done. So I'm, I'm very bullish on the page a day format I think Daily Stoic sort of tapped into that. But there's another daily read that I do every day that you might like called A Calendar of Wisdom mm -hmm. that, Never heard of it. Um, that Tolstoy wrote. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of the Stoics in it, Emerson's in it. Basically, it's like he um, – and he thought it was his greatest work, but it's it's like just a meditation, a sort of a spiritual meditation each day. So I, I very much ag uh, agree that the, the, the process is very powerful. And I think it's the fact that you've done it for four years – that you're like, I think it's so interesting that you're doing it with the same book for four years, but it's really not about the book anymore. It's the process of doing it that's the, 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 where the value yes. is. Yes. What is your morning routine and ritual? So, okay, so I have different ones, obviously, when I'm traveling or home, but this morning I got up at, at seven. I'm, I swam a mile uh, at the athletic club and then uh, I had breakfast. And while I was eating breakfast, I did the morning pages in the journal and then I read for a little bit. 
Um, and then ordinarily, if I was not sort of on a media tour, I would have gone straight. That's I would have immediately started writing. I had an interview this morning, but um, I that's my routine. It's like I want quiet time, some sort of physical activity, and then I go straight into the work. Normally, like if I'm at home, uh, I get up around the same time, but um, I take my son. I've, I've done this since he was, I don't know, maybe three months old. We go for a really long walk so my wife can catch up on sleep. And literally take a fucking hit from this, Michael. Yeah, it's Go the ahead. best. Keep, it's the, keep really there's a whole section about get long into walks this, we're going to get into. Yeah. So my, my son just like doesn't let me put him down at night. Like uh, I can put him to bed, but if he wakes up in the middle of the night, he like refuses to let me do anything, which actually has worked out quite wonderfully for me because <laughs> uh, I sleep in one uninterrupted block. But uh, I take him for a long walk in the morning. So um, it was we first started doing because it was the only way to like keep the house quiet enough for my wife to keep sleeping so we just started and then we just really f- like it's just wonderful uh just to go outside and be outside for an hour before you do anything and for it to have like no purpose so um, we live on a dirt road so we, we sort of walk um although recently about about six months ago we got uh like a bike and a bike trailer and so sometimes i just ride around he sits in the trailer but it's just his favorite part of the day we just talk he sings songs we look, see animals like we're just outside and the, the thing I've added to this um, is that I don't bring my phone anymore. So we have like an I, – I don't use my phone as my alarm clock, and then I don't sleep with it in the room, and then I don't touch it for the f- that first hour at least. So um, it's just real – like by the time I like get into the work, I, I'm in this like really pure creative space because, I you know, I spend time with my kid. I – I put my thoughts in a journal. I've been outside. I've been active, but I don't have any idea what's going on, like on social media. I don't have an idea what Donald Trump has said. <laughs> you know, I don't know what the news is. Like, no frustrating emails have come in. I'm just like totally present. I feel dirty when I wake up and check my phone. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Not, he's a little different than me. I, I keep trying to tell him how important it is not to wake up with the phone in the face. I, gotta, I, I hope go you can phases. take inspiration. I got to get this. better. But yeah. I, I just don't even want to look at it unless yeah. it's a podcast that I'm listening to. Sure, sure. Or an, uh, or a book on tape. Like the only exception I'll make is like, okay, let's say I'm driving somewhere. I need directions. Like th- there are things you can use your phone for that I don't think are a problem. But the the point the problem is like this morning. Uh, Because I'm in a hotel, I had to use my phone as the alarm clock, so it goes off, and I pick it up just to just to swipe the thing away, and it's like previewing these seven tech. I'm like, how can I not see this? Because I want to preserve, like, you. I want to preserve. A bubble is the the wrong word, but it's like it. I'm in control of that space, and and you. I don't want to. It's like I don't want to start the day on my back foot, like where I'm already reacting to stuff. That's what to me. That's really the the place I want to get to, and then ideally, if I can write from there, that that's that's where I'm going to do my best work. How long are you writing when you write? Like, let's say I started. Let's say if I started at nine, I'm I'm done by noon at the latest. So it it's not. I think people think a lot of these creative professions are like. You know, you hear like about some rapper, you know, I'm at the studio in two, at two in the morning. It's like I've worked with some rappers before. They rolled into the studio at like one. You know what I mean? Like it's I, it's typically in very what short circumst- bursts. I want to know about the circumstances of working with a rapper. So I was supposed <laughs> to uh, write a book for uh, Birdman and Slim Williams from Cash Money. OK. Uh, and so I, I spent some time with them in, in Florida and, and uh, Atlanta and New Orleans. This is maybe like. 2014 2015 right before everything blew up (laughs) everything went sideways but no it was really interesting but yeah like uh we we think that you hear a writer and you hear all the hours they work it's not consecutive hours it's not you don't like show up at nine and leave at five it's uh it's it's short creative bursts of of what Cal Newport calls, calls deep work. That's a great. That's a great book. You know, I think actually uh, more people should. I mean, I think that that kind of goes for everybody. I mean, yeah. even if, even if you're in a, a traditional structure, it's like, are you really like sitting there for nine hours no. and, and pounding at work? No. No, you're mostly on Huffington Post and digging around on the computer, pre- pretending that you're working, and yeah, I just don't want to do that. 
All right, let's. Let, we got a lot to unpack in this yeah. new book because there's a lot to unpack in it. Yeah. And I think you've you've kind of already been touching on some of the themes and some of the practices that you have in there. So stillness is the key. Let's let's just start right off the bat. How okay. would you define stillness to the audience, the people that have not read the book yet? Yeah, it's a it's a hard word to define, but I think it's this thing that we sort of intuitively know. Like when I say stillness, I think everyone has experienced moments where they've they've had it, where things are sort of slow, where you're present where you're not doing anything but the thing you're doing. Um, maybe it's maybe it's a moment with someone you love. Maybe it's a moment in nature. It's just, you're just, it's, it's like you're accessing what life is supposed to be for like a very brief instant. And, and the premise of the book is like, we've all experienced these moments. You know, you were in the mountains and it was snowing or you were, you were, you know, sitting in front of a fire or you were reading some amazing book or, you know, some flurry of inspiration at you. We know those are really powerful moments, but my question is like, why are they so rare? You know, like if there's if, if that's where your best work comes from, if that's when you're happy and when you're happiest, then why are we just content to sort of let them happen accidentally? That seems very strange. And so the book is sort of how do we intentionally think about this and how can we design life and habits and uh, thoughts to encourage it? Um, so we're not just sort of reacting all the time. Was this an idea that you were stewing over for a while or was it something where you woke up and had an epiphany or was there an experience that happened that you were like, holy shit, I need to be more still? That's a good question. I mean, I think I think uh, all of us feel like we need more stillness. Like we're, we're just like, life is way too busy. I think having kids, you do, you go, oh, like this, like being a parent, you realize is like, you're not doing anything. Like being a parent is like, I'm going to sit here and you're going to play for an hour. And like, I'm not supposed to be anywhere else. I'm not supposed to do anything else. Just this is it. And I think that was eye opening to me that like, that I was sort of thinking that, that life or success was like out here. And it's actually like right here. You know, I think that that opened my eyes a little bit, but just, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. And then it happens to be that stillness is one, you know, most of my books are influenced by stoicism and, and, and I, like you guys are talking about, you've, re you've read the Daily Stoic all these times. I'd, I'd read so much of the Stoics that it, it, I just totally missed that stillness was even something they really talked about because that wasn't what I was trying to get out of them. What I was trying to get out of them was like, how do you overcome obstacles? How do you deal with like the things you're out doing in the world? I just totally missed that actually the underlying message was how do you get to a place where you don't need really anything you know like where you're not jerked around by the things that are happening you're not sort of driven by like urges or needs you're not you know distracted by noises you're just engaged fully in whatever you're doing what, what i liked about this theory I mean, what i like about your work most of the time is that it's all but it's all very practical and yeah. and it's very it's you can it's applicable to your life it's very lo it's a logical approach like you can you can read any of your books like okay like that makes sense from a practical standpoint. I think that's very like, that's sure. The yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, but w what one thing about this with stillness is that you pointed out that most of the world religions and philosophies all agree that stillness is sure. the key. Yeah, they each have their own word for it, and they're like, if you think about like Buddha or Jesus or Marcus Aurelius or uh, Confucius, you think about sort of any of like the. Unfortunately, they're all guys, but if you think about like the guy for like each of, it's like pretty much the same guy you know what i mean like mm -hmm. you're not it's not like oh yeah jesus was all this energy and he was running around and then buddha was like more like this and then you know seneca was more like this it's like no like our idea of like what a sage is or a monk or a wise person it's pretty much all the exact same thing they're 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 just it's like they have full possession of themselves they're not they're not uh they're, they're, they have an intensity, but it's a slow, deep intensity. And I think that that's something that we've sort of lost track of. And, and, and I really admire it. And so the book is sort of like, how do you, how do you kind of get there? What are pockets of your day that you practice stillness besides taking a walk with your son? Yeah, the, the walk is a big one. The journaling is a big one. I think the, the creative work that I like, the, the, like when I write, like, a lot of times uh, I write like in the dark 
like I'll listen to the same song over and over again. What's the song? No, not the same song. Like I'll pick a You'll song. You'll pick a song. And, keep and then I listen okay. to that song. It's a, it's about sort of getting into a place where like everything is sort of just um, like the beginning and the end of the song have melded together. Like it's just in a loop, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not like checking email. I'm not like on the phone. There's no, you know, I'm not writing in a noisy coffee shop. So that that's one and then in the afternoons, like I usually do some form of, of exercise. So like uh, this morning, obviously I swam, but I'll run or swim. So some sort of exercise is that we paradoxically like movement, is, I think is a great way to get stillness. Like one of the reasons I don't, uh, I've done CrossFit before and I, I like it. I like what it does physically, but it doesn't, I don't get any of the mental benefits. It's very chaotic in there. Yeah, it's chaotic. It's too much. It raises your cortisol. Yeah. And you're around other people. So it's, it's not a solitary activity so um a lot of personalities in those crossfits yeah exactly yeah. exactly and you're and you're kind of competing with other people yeah. um to me i i like the solitary aspect so that's a big one um i'm trying to think what else i mean uh you know bedtime you'll, you'll you guys will find like bedtime is a very it's all about like the energy that you're bringing to it and so like the sort of the wind down of the the evening is something that like I know we do for the kids, but like I really like when I'm traveling, I don't get it. And it, it totally messes with my system. I feel like you you are so set with your routine when you're writing and stuff that when you have to go promote the book, it probably gives you some form of a little anxiety because it's yes. chaotic. I'm I'm kind of the same way with that. I have like my set routines. And then when I have to go out and, and out into the world and yeah. do stuff. Sometimes I have a little bit of anxiety. How do you combat that if you do have anxiety? Totally. And it, it's in a weird way, it's chaotic, but it's a different, it's not chaotic. Like what it, what it really is. Let me see. Like I'm the, the problem for me is that my cat, my, the problem for me is what my calendar is, right? That it's like, I woke up that this is like my worst nightmare. Like, I don't like that. You don't like a packed calendar. I want my calendar to look like that. I, f I think you said that on Twitter. You don't. You don't, I, you don't I, even want to look at my calendar. Yeah, I don't. I don't want freak things. you out. So to me, I don't like it's a, that I like. I have to come here, and then we can't like just talk. Like I have to. Then I have to go to another thing and another thing. I, that's what I really don't like. But one of the things, like, w the problem with that is for me, and and where it causes like anxiety is that it's like okay, so if I could just do that, if I could just say like okay. Today is not mine. I'm waking up at this time and I'm doing this through this and I'm just going to go from thing to thing and that's all that I have to do. I, I think I would be stiller and calmer and I could just go with the flow. But the problem is what I'm actually doing is like, okay, now I have 15 minutes in the car. I have to catch up on email and then I have to make this phone call and then look at all these phone calls that I missed. And then like, well, I got to squeeze in writing time. And then what about, so I think it's that I, I take the thing that I'm doing and then I'm adding in all my normal stuff on top of that thing. And that's where that's where the anxiety comes from. So I have to kind of remind myself that, like, I signed up for this. Um, I don't have to do anything, you know, like I could not do any of it. And uh, and and, you know, if I'm a little late or this like that, the rigidity that I'm projecting on it is is usually the source of my anxiety. So I have to, like, kind of like relax and just try to go from thing to thing and and not put like pressure on myself yeah as long as it's not an everyday thing and you're like selecting yeah. pockets of time where it's just gonna let's just say it's gonna suck for a minute you yeah know but I mean? as content creators and writers and artists i think um and just being creative in general we our favorite part is to create the thing mm -hmm. and then you realize if you want to take it to the next level you have to go out and distribute it and promote it yes and sometimes that can give an artistic person anxiety totally yeah, you're like I didn't I didn't get into this to become a salesman and it's like well if you don't sell it you don't get to keep doing it and the thing I remind myself too is it's like what does it say if you don't what does it say about it that you don't sell it you know like if you just put it out in the world I think you're saying like it's not you don't actually believe in it that um, you're like afraid to tell people that you think they should buy it um, you have to push yourself yeah, you do. You do. And uh, I think that's a good indicator for anyone. If they're in, in any career path, they're getting, if they're not like out there promoting and happy to do it. I mean, listen, yeah. nobody nobody wants to run around and do the circuit. But if yeah. it's 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 almost like, well, why are you really happy doing this thing? Are you proud yeah. of doing it? Should you be doing it? Like maybe do something else. 
Yeah, and I always I I think what I think about is like when I flash forward six months from now, do I want to feel like I left anything on the table because I was like either I, I see this with people they're like oh i don't want to do that like like there's like an arrogance like they 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 think they're too good for it or um you know do i want to go like oh but i was tired or like i didn't like i don't want to feel like i left anything on the table but but if if i can if if you can be present in the moment whatever it is even if it's it's a really hard shitty thing i think it'll it, it's easier than if you're trying to do it and worry about the thing that you just did and you're stressing about the thing that you have coming up next now you're doing three things at once instead of one you said that you gave this concept and i don't know if it was the concept or the book or proposal to robert green to read before you decided to fully commit to it you said that on rich roll yeah i guess i did so is robert green someone that you go to all the time for advice like is do you always send your ideas to him do you guys work together on books I know you guys have both been inspirations for each other. I mean, I think it's much more the other way around. Like, uh, uh, he's been an inspiration to me. But uh, like I saw him last night, we had dinner. Um, and and then after di- we had dinner with a mutual friend. And so afterwards, I realized that I hadn't asked him about something. And like, I have I have whatever the, the book that I want to do next out, like it's being sort of negotiated. And, and so uh, like, I'll probably call Robert today and go like, you know, like, OK, here's the offer. You know, like, what do you think about that? Like, I, I always want to run things by him. One, because he gives really good advice. Um, and, and this is what he does. Like, this is, uh, it, I have the unfair advantage of having access to one of, like, the most strategic people on the planet. Um, it's an intimidating guy to talk to sometimes. Of course. Like, what's, what's this guy figuring out about me right now? Yeah. And, and, and so that's, like, obviously amazing. And then the other thing is, like, he's been in this business so long. Yep. So I think you want... You don't just want to ask, like, okay, you have this grandfather or grandmother who gives really good advice. Like, obviously, you want to ask them, but you also want to talk to someone who knows how your business works. It's a proven like, success in the space. Yeah, and, and they, you know, I went through this on this project or think about this or, like, you know, you know maybe this dilemma you're having is actually a false dilemma. You can do both. And so, uh, you know, I'm just very lucky to have access to, to someone. And, and, like, I remember thinking – uh, when I was his research assistant, like, you know, what is an hour of Robert Greene's time worth? And here this person is paying me to go do things. And then every once in a while I get to ask them. So I always thought that, like, how I was getting paid working for Robert Greene was that I could occasionally ask him questions and then he would answer. Smart was smart. I mean, look what's happened. Yeah. And like, like I remember. So so in 2000. Not that he can take all the credit. I mean, you obviously put in a ton of work. I mean, I think he could take most of it. In, two, in 2007 or 2009, I forget what it was, I someone approached me about writing a book about stoicism. And so I was like, this is my dream. Like, this is what I, you know. And I asked Robert, and he was like, you can't do it. He's like, you're not ready. You, like, have to turn it down, uh, which was, like, you know, very hard for, I don't know how old I was in 2000. I guess I was 20. Uh, maybe it was 21, 22. But so it was like, I thought that was my shot. And he was like, this is not your shot. Like, if you take this shot, you'll, it, it won't be what you want it to be. And uh, he was totally right. And so Trust Me Online came out maybe two years after that, um, which was definitely the right book to do first. And that set up. So let's say The Obstacles Away came out four or five years after that first conversation it was a profoundly different and better book because of that advice. And, and if left to my own devices, I, I mean, why would I have said no, right? It was only that someone had been there before and, you know, knew what was up. Out of all his books, which ones impacted you the most? That's a good question. You know, I feel one of the, one of the only downsides about working for Robert is that I don't get to experience the books the way that I used to. So it's like, you know, I read Mastery as a Galley and then I, you know, I read Laws of Human Nature as a Galley and and sort of in different forms. And so uh, those books are amazing. I love them. They haven't quite hit me the same way that I got, that it hit me when I, you know, bought his off the shelf at a bookstore and I didn't know who he was. So 48 Laws of Power is probably one of the biggest. And then um, 33 Strategies of War uh, was, was probably the other. I mean, they're all like ex- extremely incredible books. I mean, totally. I, 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 there's certain authors like they, you get to a certain point, like, God damn, that's a good writer. I mean, and he's he's up there. 
Yeah, no, I think in in music you experience it more. Like uh, I was listening to the new Bruce Springsteen album, and you're just like, "How is this possible? Like, how are, how did you do it again?" Because most most bands like are still making music, but they're not. It's not actually good. It's just like, oh, that's you know, even Iron Maiden, which I love. Like, I'm not really super into the new stuff, but like the new Bruce Springsteen album is like, if you told me it came out like 30 years ago, you'd be like, yeah, have to check it out. Yeah, it, but but when you when you experience someone who can do that, you're just like, it's it's unreal. Okay, so let's get let's get back to stillness. Okay, why why, why is it so difficult for us to achieve stillness? Like, what what is the main? What's the like? If you could dumb it down, like, why yeah. do we have such a difficult time? Well, I think like so. Obvi- the the easy answer is like devices and media and all the things that are going on in the world, and that does explain a good chunk of why um, we're we are the way that we are. But uh, I opened the book. There's a quote from Blaise Pascal. He said, uh, "All of man's." problems stem from his inability to sit quietly in a I room love that alone quote. well that quote's 500 years old which is just insane if you think about it right that for five at least 500 years we've had this problem but really it's more like for all of time we've had this problem i think it's that when you're busy doing you don't have to think about anything uncomfortable um, you don't have to deal with your mortality. You don't have to deal with your fears. You don't have to deal with your worries. You don't have to deal with whatever shit you have from your childhood. You don't have to feel anything because you're just doing. But the problem is you're just def- you're just deferring that. It's all like you're it's like you're putting it on a credit card, and eventually it's going to come back, and you're paying a super high interest rate on it. So I think uh, one of the reasons we're not still is we're just really afraid of what we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Oh, I fucking hate my job. Or, oh, this relationship is actually terrible for me. Or, you know, like, why do I live in New York City? I hate this place. This is awful. You know, like we I think we're afraid of some of what we're going to find out that's like sort of lurking just below the surface. That's probably one. It's almost like people facing their finances, logging into their checking account and saying, yeah. like, what's actually going on? So they on don't. Here? So they don't. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, you know, I think the other part is that it's it's also work. You know what I mean? Like, uh th- it's, it's easier to just sort of take things on, on, on the surface level. The idea of like deciding to probe or deciding to, to not be, you know, that, that to actually think about what the, the person on the other side of the exchange is actually thinking, right? To be like, oh, they don't, you know, you want to go like, this person's an asshole. How could they do this to me? You don't want to go like, well, did they do it on purpose? Or what were their motivations? Like we, it's, it's more work to, to sort of stop and probe these things. So that's another reason we don't do them. With the cell phone, too, I feel like when we look to our cell phone, sometimes it's almost like a pain pill. Yes. I feel like a lot of people are doing that now. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I experience it with work. So, like, let's say I'm let's say I get into an argument with my wife or I'm like, you know, frustrated with, you know, something that's in my house or like I'm frustrated with how things are going. I can like sometimes I'll have found that I just I walked upstairs. And I sat down. And I just started working because I can't control whatever that is. I can't make it the way that I want it to be. But my work, I have complete control over. And so you can see how easily you could see that it's not that different than uh, like heroin or it's not that different than sex or, or any of the things that you do to make you feel not the way that you feel uh, in that moment and that you can get that sort of relief on demand for someone that says i don't know how to sit still i don't even know where to start yeah what would you recommend without overwhelming them like give us a little tiny tip no i mean and that's something i thought a lot about with the book because like when you hear stillness you think oh this must be about meditation and like um it's not in the book at all Uh, very deliberately so I, i don't meditate it doesn't work for me and I also sort of understand most people, it's like most people have spoken. They're like, I'm not going to do this. So I tried to think about what are other ways to get there. Um, and it's sort of the equivalent of like, it's like talking to a really, really fat person and going like, let me tell you about this sort of the, the ins and outs of micronutrition. It's like, this is so far beyond what they need to make real sizable like changes and impact in their life. So I think like I think walks are a great one. Like just the idea of like like I got here like a couple minutes early and I just went for a walk. Like I just walked around. It's like I'm gonna I'm I'm not gonna sit here and be on my email. I'm not gonna try to squeeze another thing in. 
I'm not just going to sit on, on a couch and kill time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my body in motion, but I'm going to do it in a way that's designed to sort of slow things down and clear the mind. I think what we're really trying to do with stillness is clear the mind. And meditation is one way to do that, but there's lots of other ways to do that. You could decide like, hey, I'm not going to have CNBC running on a television in my office all day while I'm at work. Like your dad has the news. His dad has the news. It's horrible for all you. All day. It's horrible. Dude, we this guy... slept over at his house the other night, and I said to Michael, I said, I cannot do this. This is rising my cortisol. It's from the minute he wakes up to the minute he goes to bed. Love you, Gary. <laughs> Flipping through all the channels, yeah. news constantly. It's, like, mean, it's too much. It's like in the background. I remember that this is like a, the way I think about it. Growing up, we, we had these friends – uh, and we'd go over to their house, and they always had Fox News on their TV. And you remember TVs? I, I, maybe it's still in the technology, but I remember if you left one, you know, if you like pause the TV for too long, it would get burned into the TV. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And so they always had Fox News on. And so when we would change the channel to like watch something else, the you know what's it called, the cryon? That's like the lower third, and then the logo. That was permanently burned into the TV. Like you could see the outline of Fox News, <laughs> even if you were watching like Comedy Central, right? Because like that's how. And and so I, I kind of think about when you're watching the news, it's doing that. There's that residue on your body. Like these are people who are deliberately trying to provoke you, who are giving you what's mostly trivia, and and they are giving you mostly information that you have you'll never actually use in your life and so like yeah i think if you just like let's let's start by looking at your media diet i wanted right? to dive into this like, yeah. you call it the cnn effect right yes. in the book yeah the, so and it's a it's a real like sort of psychological term they they and and historical term they talk about how hard it is to say be president when you have to make really long-term big picture decisions but it's being dissected and analyzed in real time on television Right. So instead of, uh, you know, it used to be they would make a decision and then like a month later, you'd find out how it went. Now it's like in real time, people are reacting to it. And this makes it increasingly hard for the president to, to or any leader, whether it's CEO or any parent to think uh, you guys will see this with parents like these parents are making these decisions based on like this brand new study that just came out rather than thinking like, well, what strategies have parents always used, right? And so instead of, again, being present and instead of thinking about, like, principles, they're thinking about, like, breaking news. And so they're always, like, worried about this or that. This is a sidebar to that. But, I mean, the, Lauren and I waited well, – Lauren primarily – waited five months to tell people that she was pregnant, right? Yeah. And it's because, one, we wanted to have a moment. I mean, there's a million yeah. reasons. Yeah. We've talked about it. But – a lot of it is because right when she told people she was pregnant, it was like information overload. You should do this. You should be yeah, in this. You should sure. that. And it was like, at some point you have to turn it all off because it becomes completely distracting to the process of her just like having a healthy pregnancy for herself. The best thing I did though is, and it has to do with stillness, is be still with the pregnancy. We had yeah. five months to just yeah. I, I was able to absorb it. I was able to think about it, and I also feel like that energy goes to the baby. Of course, yeah. You don't need to turn like you don't need to. Tr so many of the parents I know, it's like they turn their kid into like a business or a company that they have. <laughs> and, and instead of being like, this is a human being, my job is mostly to not let them die and to like, you know, mostly just make life pleasant for them for a reasonable period of time. How will you teach your kids stillness? Um, I mean, we're trying to think about it now. Like, it's interesting. You watch, you, it's like if you watch, and he's a character in the book, but like you watch something like Mr. Rogers and then you compare Mr. Rogers to say like Blippy. Have you guys watched Blippy yet? Mm -mm. Oh man, just no, wait till you get to Blippy. Blippy's like the biggest thing on YouTube for kids. <laughs> he is like, uh, I don't know. He's, he's like the like new Mr. Rogers. No, he's like the opposite of Mr. Rogers. Okay. He's like a spaz. Like he's just crazy, and he drives tractors and trucks, and he does all this. It's it's the kids love it, but like the energy is just totally different than say a Mr. Rogers. So just thinking about like what do you expose them to, what do you not expose them to. One of the things that we, we think about is like, okay, so your kid wakes up in the morning and if you hear them on the baby monitor, your instinct is like, let me rush in and get them. And it's like, actually, no, they need to learn how to be by themselves and you're watching them. So it's not like they can hurt themselves, but like, you don't, you, how do you, how do you let them become a self-sufficient person who's okay being by themselves? That is such good advice. That is such good advice. And what? Those helicopter parents aren't going to like that. No, Michael, you don't need. You cannot be a ham. I'm. I'm not. He, well, that listen. is really good advice. I'm. I'm all Let ears. Let them be independent. 
I, I agree. Okay. I mean, listen, I don't want to have well, to be, I'm I don't be running clip. across the well, room. If you guys like Daily Stoic, I have an email. I haven't turned it into a book yet, but I do one called Daily Dad. That's a, a like a sort of Dad. ancient, ancient sto- it's dailydad.com, but it's like sort of stoicism, but also just ancient wisdom inspired sort of parenting stuff. So I'm thinking about it all the time myself. Like, I mean, I've only done it three years, so I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to think about and study what other people have done. Have you guys decided what you're going to do about pictures? Like, are you gonna sh- are you gonna share or not share? Because well, like you you obviously you're on the private Instagram. We decided not to do any photos. Here's the thing. I like what you did. I think that's cool. No, I I think that it's a part of my my life and my profession is to be on social media. So yes, the baby will be on social media, but I'm not going to turn it into what I lead with in my narrative. Okay. So it's not gonna be posted on on every other post. I'm not. The baby doesn't need to be posted every single day. It's. It's it's a character in my life, but it's also it's also um, it doesn't need to be like mommy blogger, mommy blogger, mommy sure, blogger. Does sure. that make sense? Here's totally. the thing: we're not raised in blanket like Michael Jackson. Like the, yeah. you know, the, the kid, it might it might get seen, and yeah. we're not gonna. It's not like oh my god, gotta hide the face. I mean, it's sure, too much sure, effort. Sure. But at the same time, we're not going to be just like blasting it out to the no, world. No, there's all the time. there's certain influencers which everyone needs to do them and do it how yeah. they want to do it, but that just they like plaster. pivoted to being a mommy blogger the second they had a kid. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't I want to still lead with my beauty wellness, you know, sure. um hacks kind of thing and then like the baby is there but not the main the no, main that's event. A good way to think about it. Yeah. And it's a, it's weird too because like uh this is what you guys do. So in a way I understand it's like this is our family so like they're It's all... almost harder to like to if it's like oh my god we got to hide the it's, yeah. it's too much. I think it's it's but it's also like you're being compensated for it. So it like benefits the kid. But it's all it's weirder. I find I find it to be a little more disconcerting when I see parents who are who are just doing it for like the raw naked validation from the other parents. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel icky. I've even seen like like this sounds crappy because my, my, my parents are great. But like I can tell that when they come visit, one of the things they're thinking about is the photo that they're going to get out of it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? For the and and pe- that's what people do, and it's really kind of sad. And here like, come the messages, Ryan. Get ready, <laughs> right. buckle in. Yeah, so they're not listening. Uh, but do you know what I mean? That like people eh, people are not actually. And to me, this is the opposite of stillness. They're not interested in the experience. They're interested in letting other people know that they had the experience, and that's like really hard. That's like really sad because like you only get so many experiences. Do you know what I mean? It's so hard to balance as a blogger. What, what I, that's I, something I have to pr- actively practice. Sure. Well, what I think people also should understand, and like I've been very vocal about this, like there's a time where there's content being put out. Then yeah. There's a, a much greater time when there's n- not content being put out. You sure. know, we're on, we're on dinner together, we're on vacation, like being private. Yeah. Like I think people should understand that. It's like, yes, there's certain things you show and certain things are just like, listen, me and my wife just yeah. having a private alone moment. Yeah. Like normal people. This is going to sound wild, but I think someone who's done such a good job of this, and this is going to sound wild, so bear with me, is Kylie Jenner. Okay. And because I think that she, one, she didn't tell anyone she was pregnant for nine months because she, she just wanted to be pregnant. Yeah. And and kept that a secret. And then with if you go look at her Instagram, it's not baby, 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 baby. It's still she's still doing her twenty one year old, you sure. know, lip kit thing. Yeah. And the baby's here and there, but it's not slapped everywhere. Right. Sure. I know Kylie Jenner's that's like yeah. what you wouldn't expect. Yeah, sure. But but here's I think she could put her baby in every single picture. Well, it goes to my and point get of likes and comments and blah 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 and she doesn't. It goes to my point of them like choosing when they're actually putting content. I mean they, yeah. people have to I mean, even if you see a someone's story and it takes up three minutes of the day, it's like there's twenty four hours in the day. Like you yeah, know, they're choosing sure. to, to show you three minutes of this day that's a curated version of that. No, and, and like you're saying, it is a dilemma when it's what you're doing. But you're also being paid for it. So like you're compensated for, I think it's hard when you're watching like regular people going like the only person getting paid here is Facebook or 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 mm-hmm. uh, or Twitter and like I can just t- like I can tell it's like oh you weren't feeling good today that's why you posted this photo either of you which it's like if you want to do it to yourself again you're a consenting adult I just get grossed out thinking like oh you're using your baby as a prop not even to make money, which is good for the you're using the baby as a prop to validate yourself. And that if if you start that, that can't be you're you're obviously doing it also in other worse ways. Like it also home. can probably be addictive too. Yes. Like the pregnancy, I, I I told Michael this. I said, you know, people love pregnancy. I can see why people right. you know, want to post like yeah. every second of it. 
Yeah. Well, what I think, you know, like one one thing that, we're, and this is probably always, I mean, it's always been people chasing, people chasing. But there's an example you use in your book with Kurt Vonnegut and I forget the, uh, Joseph, Joseth Heller, Heller yeah. right? And they're, and they're in a billionaire's house and you could say this better, but maybe you could tell the story. They, they're in his house and yeah. they're basically talking like, wow, look at all this great stuff. And one of them says, yeah, one of them says, how does it feel? Joseph Heller wrote Catch-22, which was one of the great novels of the 20th century. And he, he said, uh, Kurt Vonnegut said, how does it feel to know that this guy made more money this week than your novel will make in its whole lifetime? And, and, and Heller said, well, I have something he doesn't have. Vonnegut said, what could that possibly be? And he said, a sense of enough. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, met, I've met billionaires and millionaires and people have sold, you know, millions of albums or have millions of social media followers or won Super Bowl rings. Like there's a profound difference when you meet someone who's good, like they're just like, I'm good. And then the person who needs like who, who even despite everything they've done, like there's just never enough for them. Well, I think this is such an important theme to talk about, especially on this show with people that are, you know, you're, you're following that person on social, you're seeing this person sell a company, you're seeing wh whatever yeah. it is, and you're, and you're getting anxiety. You're like, I'm chasing this. You're comparing this thing. yourself yes. to them, and you don't realize that actually it really sucks to be them. And you haven't sat back and said, like, is that something you'd actually really want? Is that a life you'd actually really want to that's, live, even if it was an option? Yeah, that's totally right. And, and going like, and, and, and actually stepping back and realizing that it's really sad. Right. Like that the, the success is not sad. Um, the, the success is is actually totally un, like an unrelated part of this. Like um, there's a difference between <clears throat> needing to win a Super Bowl to make your dad proud of you and winning a Super Bowl because you like playing football and you've really dedicated yourself to like being the best you can be this year. Those are fundamentally different places to come from and they can each one can create the same result. And so, yeah, the, the person who, who is doing, doing, doing because they're trying to, like, if, you, if you've, you've read The Great Gatsby, he's trying to go back in time and it's never going to happen. And it's like nobody can communicate to him that you, he goes, you can't go back in time. And he says, of course you can. And so he was trying to chase this actually horrible woman who, who uh, you know, was using him. But like, that's what people are doing. They think like, if I just win another championship, if I just like I have a million dollars, but if I had ten million dollars, if I had a hundred million dollars, I could have my own plane, and then I would be like, you know what I mean? Like, Vaughn so and I talk about it all the time. Yeah. We were talking about it this weekend on a flight. The if then, yeah, like th there's a we have people in our lives, and listen, we've been guilty yeah. of it too. I've definitely been guilty of it, yeah. saying like if then, if when, then I will be. Yeah, they call it conditional happiness. Like if I can get, if these conditions are met, then I'm going to be happy. It's like, no, if you can't be happy now, you can never be happy. Right. And okay. Obviously it's harder to be happy if you're starving or, sure. you know, if you're being abused. So we're not, we're not, we're, these are the, we're talking about first world enough, you know, mm -hmm. like this is after you have a car and a place to live. Basic living. Yes. Is covered. Yes. We're, we're talking about the person who, despite making $500,000 a year, feels poor because their boss makes a million dollars a year, right? Or whatever it is. Or the person having X followers and being unhappy because the person above them has X more followers. Yeah, or they have X followers, but all they're thinking about is why this specific photo didn't get the likes that they wanted it to get. And what does that say about them as a person? We've seen scenarios like we have friends that they start these businesses and they're and the business are doing fine. They're doing great. But they're so unhappy in the process, so unhappy buildings are like, well, it's not here yet. And when it gets yeah. here, then I'll be able to do this and I'll be happy. I'm like, if you don't enjoy the process now, when you get there, it's not going to you're going to feel the same exact way. You might. It's just going to be a, a higher stakes and probably actually more obligations. When I, I try to talk to people about like, what do you what do you where are you actually trying to get? Not like a number, but like, what do you want your life to be? Right. Like, what do you like doing? How do you want your life to be? So for me, what I realize is like, uh. Uh, as much as financial success is important, like what, what's actually critical to my happiness is autonomy. So like when I'm not in control of like generally how my life is, when I'm doing things I don't want to do. That's when I'm unhappy, even if I'm being paid a lot of money for that. And obviously there's a balance. But but it, what I realize is it's like, oh, so if you told me, hey, Ryan, um, if you started this company, <clears throat> it would take seven years. And then at the end of the company, you'd have one hundred million dollars. 
that would be very tempting. But I'd, I, what I would try to remind myself is that I'd have to spend seven years doing shit that I don't want to do. Like I was talking to a friend of mine who was an author and um, he started a, a venture capital fund and uh, they raised a lot of money. And, and I was walking them through. I was like, OK, so if this works like so you're, you're not going to be able to write for a long time. Uh, if this works, let's say you walk away with $20 million at the end of this, which would be extremely, extreme success, right? Um, what what would you do? And he basically like described some version of like being an author again. And I was like, what? You know, like, <laughs> uh, so you, it's like, what would you do if money wasn't an issue? And oftentimes it's much closer to what you're currently doing than you want to admit. But we, we go, oh, but... Like I need that ceaseless desire to help me get over that hump. And the problem is you get over the hump and then you're the same fucking person and didn't do what you thought it was going to do. What would you say to someone that's listening that's constantly playing the comparison game on social media? Like where would you tell them to start maybe tactics or habits that they could add to their routine that would help? I mean, what? so I, I have a couple. So one is I just tell myself everyone's a liar. Like I just say <laughs> everyone's lying so that like, you know, it's like, oh, you see someone on a private jet. I just go, they rented this just for the photos or, you know, or that this is five years old, this photo. Or, or they Google imaged it like yeah, Bow Wow. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or so like when I hear someone. Poor Bow Wow. When I hear someone go like, oh, they got a book deal for X. I go, yeah, but, you know, let's say because, you know, you can lie with these things. So it's like maybe 50 percent of it's guaranteed, but the rest of it's earnouts, and they're mm -hmm. never going to do that. So it's actually like same half. thing with companies when they sell. Yeah. Right, yeah, someone, oh, did you hear they sold their company for $20 million? It's like, actually, they sold it for like $100,000 and $19,900,000 in worthless stock that they never, <laughs> but, but, you know, so I, I just go like, I just assume everything's exaggerated and lied and lying. Not, not to be cynical, but just so <clears throat> I, just to like cancel it out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, because the truth is it doesn't affect me. I'm just telling myself that it matters. So that's one strategy that I use. The other thing is like on social media, what I always remind myself is I go like, look at your feed and then you know how unrepresentative this is of your actual life. But the problem is then you compare your, you compare your actual life to other people's fake life and then you feel insecure. If you were comparing their actual life to your actual life, you'd probably feel much better. That is such good advice. Yeah. That is such good advice. You know, th there's one thing that, and I had to go through my own struggle with this a while back because I had to have a whole life crisis and figure out, you know, I was motivated by the wrong things. We talked about this a while ago. But anyways, I, what the, the thing that I found interesting was I got to a place where I'm like, okay, what do I actually want? I was like, yeah. I want a place where I have autonomy. I yeah. can live with my wife, travel when we need to once in a while, spend time together, read a shit ton of books, like yeah. not be bothered. Like, it's very, actually very simple what I actually want. Yes. But what I had to balance that against was, okay, if I do have enough, how do I also stay motivated to go and sure. build and accomplish things? And I think that that's an interesting balance once you get to the place like, okay, I'm, I'm actually happy and yeah. I'm, I have enough. But I still, like, just as a human being, want to be pushed and struggle and accomplish different things. Like, how would you coach someone to say, I mean, well, that coach, I, but, 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 you know what I'm saying here? Like, yeah, how yeah. do you still find motivation when you realize, okay, maybe I do have enough, but I still want to get shit done? Yeah, I mean, I, I like, <clears throat> when I, I wanted to be a writer, and so I thought that meant you have a book, mm -hmm. right? But then as soon as the book came out, it's like, actually, no, it's only success if it's a bestseller. And then it's like, but what am I going to do next? And how can I make sure that next deal is bigger? So you're you're like, next, next, next. And this is preventing you from enjoying yep. any of it. Um, and and so like clearly that that has helped me do a lot, but it's also prevented me from enjoying a lot of it. And so what I try to remind myself is, okay, the, the, the motivation, that's what – that's what motivated the deals like that, that mm -hmm. need that's that put the deals, but the actual work, like the thing that actually made any of those books worth reading or valuable was the opposite of that attitude. That was me quietly sitting down, doing the work, loving the process, being present. Right. And so I have to remind myself that the motivation is like a tiny fraction of what matters. Um, what actually matters is what you deliver. So I think, I think we over, like we'll go like oh this person's really angry look at how successful they are like is is their anger the reason they're successful or is it that they're really tall you know and that's why they're good at basketball you know, or whatever right yeah. like is <clears throat> is Kanye West ego why he's a great rapper or is that <clears throat> it's his like fascination and love of music and creativity and passion 
that's so profoundly unique that it it compensates for the ego that's always getting them in trouble. As a millennial listener, there's a lot of millennial <clears throat> listeners. Where would you tell them to start which book out of all your books? Oh, my books? That's a good question. Probably ego. I think ego is the enemy. I told you that he'd say that. Yeah. Well, I think I think that one's a super solid. Or, Just to or, stroke my ego, I told you. Yeah. But I think if you're but but if you are but but if you're someone that's maybe struggling right now, I actually think obstacles a good one. Probably. That's when yeah. I first because I was going through some shit and I was like, oh, and then I connected with that book. Um, I love ego. Too. Yeah, it's a tr- so the way I see it is a trilogy, but not a chronological one. So it's like three books that are interrelated and have uh, sort of similar inspirations, but you can come at it from any angle. Okay. All right. I like it. Uh, book podcast. Wait, resor- I have a couple more questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh. Cause we have a little more time. I yeah, wanna- we got tons of time. Are uh, you sure? I want to make yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. So if I get here by one thirty, I'm fine. Okay. Why? Like you, you have a, a few recurring characters in the book. One of them's Tiger Woods. Yes. And one of them is Mr. Rogers. And I don't yes. think you could, you could correlate two two more <laughs> different people. And then Joseph Kennedy's a recurring character. Yep. And then, uh, so is Anne Frank. I think those are the recurring characters. Yes. Yes. Why, like, what got you interested in focusing on those people, specifically Mr. Rogers and Tiger Woods? So, so I started writing this book in like early 2017, maybe late 2016. So this was like right before the Mr. Rogers resurgence. So I thought I'd like, like, I remember Mr. Rogers growing up, but I don't remember thinking that much about him. And then I, I read like an article or I saw a video and then I started really digging in and I read some books by some friends of his about him. And I was like, holy shit, this guy's like a saint. Like, is this a real person? Uh, and then I found out, then it was announced like Tom Hanks was playing him in a movie and then there was a documentary and then there's a book. So it feels a little bit less of like, a, you know, a discovery. But this is, again, a reason why you can't be that concerned with, with results. Like, I thought I was going to be first, but I wasn't. But what I, the real value was that I just learned a lot about this person and I got something out of it, right? Um so he was just a fascinating person. And, and again, like, I'm just, I love the energy and I love like where he seemed to be coming from. And uh, what, what one of the things I learned from Robert Greene that I think I've done better in the in ego and obstacle and less good in, or sorry, in ego and stillness, less good in obstacle is really the key of having uh, pro and con examples. Um it's easy just to find things that confirm what you're saying. It's harder to find people who sort of prove the opposite of what you're saying. And, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a powerful way to, for readers to learn. So Tiger Woods is in there mostly as an example of like how not to be. Um, and uh, and I, I find those, those to be the most challenging to research and write about. All right. La- last thing I want to jump into because I got in some hot water about this the other day, and I figured like oh. you're, you're a better person to. Okay. You're going to say this more eloquently than he than, wrote an article on it. Yeah, I know. That's why I want to talk about oh. it. So I was talking the other day on the podcast and saying basically I don't want people to just cold outreach and say let's go to coffee. Pick my brain. Yes, please. It's, fuck that. Yeah, but, yes, because <laughs> and 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 the mo- the main reason that the main thing I was trying to point out is that the people asking need to refine the way they're approaching people because it's sure. it's. it's it, it's just straight up a bad strategy to cold out. Say, yeah. can I get coffee and pick yeah. your brain? And then I went into this whole thing about like the value of an actual cup of coffee yes. and the value of someone's experience. Yeah. But this, this goes into the, a topic that you wrote about in your book about saying no. Yes. Okay, let's talk about it a little bit because I, I think that there's a more eloquent way that I can really explain. dissect it though, because like, I feel like, and what it costs you to say yes. And I yeah. think that's been, that was like yeah. the, the core of your article that you wrote. We've had a lot of messages about this. So, okay. And so people thought what you're being like arrogant. Some people, people were like, love this message. Yeah. Some people were like, you're arrogant. Some people saying, okay, well like, do you not like, you know, if you're further along the path, don't you want to take time? And my point was, listen, I take time all the time with people. I do this yeah. show every week. I sit yeah. down with people. Sure. The main thing was like, if your strategy is to cold outreach to someone, say, can I pick your brain over coffee? Yeah. One, you're going to get a lot of no's. And two, it's just not an even transit. Like a better way is like, what kind of value can you provide? What's a unique angle? And then like, is it, are you being lazy? Yeah. No, right? people like, you just even think about what that expression, pick your brain. is. It's like, can I steal something from you? Yes. Um, and, and you're stealing the one thing that people can't get back, which is time. Um, yes. So I, I'm, yeah, I say no to almost everything. Uh, I've, I've had to even realize that even saying no is an imposition. And so a lot of stuff I just ignore. I mean, this is a wonderful, privileged place to be, not a place I would have ever anticipated being. But it's true. Like if I, if I even sent a polite no to everyone that wanted to get coffee or wanted me to be on their podcast or wanted me to 
blurb their book or whatever. I never have any time to do what you like, need to do. What? Yeah, not even what I need to do, but like what I want to do. Like you know, like uh, there's this great essay. Uh, I, f- I forget who wrote it, but it, the title is like "No One Wants to Read Your Shit," <laughs> and it's like about screenwriters who email other screenwriters. That can, and they're, they're like, "Here's all the things I have to read for me." Here's all the things I have to read for my friends. And then here's all the things that random people on the internet want me to read. Like, it's just, it doesn't work. You have to, I think people, I, I see this, the, the other version of this I see, and, and it's how I got started, but they, they're missing how it actually works. They're saying, can I work for you guys for free? And even, as nice as that is, they're not even thinking that there's a cost to, the, they're thinking I'm offering to work for them to, for free. They're not thinking, first off, Got to integrate them in the organization. You got to train well, them. No, you they're not even work. thinking like it's not like you guys have a bunch of things that you need done that you can't afford to pay someone to do, mm-hmm. right? That's like that, well, especially now with all the stuff we have, Postmates, you know, yeah, Uber, like yeah. there's a million things, a million services, right? But, task it, grab, but, but your business is successful. You don't if you if there was an ROI on a task, you would just pay someone to do it, and if not, you would just not do it. So if they think that it's it's fulfilling a need, which it's really not, and they're not thinking that even the like finding something for this totally unproven, unknown person to do and then trusting them with access and with your time is incredibly expensive. So what you have to, what what you need to do is figure out a skill or a thing you can do for people and offer to do that thing. Yes. Um, and so like, for instance, I get people go like, I noticed this error in your book, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll offer to like, you know, um, proofread articles for me or something. This actually usually makes me angry because I already pay someone to proofread them, and it, which means that they missed it. But like that is a much better ask. Or uh, you know, if someone said like, "Hey, um, uh, I love your podcast, but um, you know, I noticed you're using a sample for your intro music. I'm a really great musician. Could I write you a new theme? Uh, whatever." And you'd be like, "Well, I'll at least look at that." Sure. And then ma- like p- people don't realize that these relationships ensue over time and then it's usually begins with a demonstration of value so it's not hey can i have an hour of your time to get coffee like the list of the people that i want to have coffee with is already very long i'm not even doing that the and I, by the way i haven't seen my dad in a month but let me you know right. what yeah, I mean? like, exactly why am i getting coffee with some random right. person when i haven't seen my dad let me point something else out though too it just comes down to self-awareness like even when we had you on the show yeah I mean, listen the show's grown yeah. and it's great if you listen but it, it was episode 83 i'm looking at my notes right now okay and what I, what I'm, the reason I'm telling you this is I was like, okay, eventually I knew we wanted to get guys like you and, and Robert and some of the people we've had yeah. on the show on, but it's like, okay, let's put in the work first. Let's yeah. make sure there's a dedicated audience. Let's sure. share. We got, I mean, 83 episodes before we, we sat down with you the first time. And, and the reason being is I want to make sure, okay, like we read these books, we had a platform for them. Like yeah. we put in the time, like even things like that. If you're doing sure. a podcast, you're creating content and you want to out, reach out. I mean, listen, I'm going to go sit down with Warren Buffett. I, just, I got yeah. a lot of work until I can do yeah, that. But the point is, is like, it comes to from all angles like there's certain people that i eventually would, would, and lauren too would love to get on this show but it's like put in the work dedicate the time to be able to build it so that when you do make that ask there's a real benefit to that person to say yes as opposed to just like hey can you come it's like yeah let's get totally. rid of can i pick your brain too i feel like we we got to get more creative with that <laughs> yeah no no and and like the, the the funny thing that i always think about is like like i'll get an email and they'll be like hey like i really like your stuff blah blah can i ask you a question and it's like you just asked me a question you would have been better off skipping all of this and just sending me an unsolicited email and saying like, hey, uh, what's a book I should read about X? And it would take me five seconds to respond to this. And then you could reply having read the book with a question of like, it, it, it's like people, it's like going around, it's like walking up to a pretty stranger and saying like, hey, do you want to get married? Like what? Like you're so far, you're putting the cart so far before the horse. It's like, it's creepy. You should you should be saying like hello, you know, uh, like to start with that, and and so like all the research assistants that I've had, it's a relationship that's evolved over time. They asked me a question, they saw this, they noticed something, you know, and uh, you know, people are getting lazy. You know, they, they, he was like, well, people, my my coach says seek mentors. It's like yeah. yes, that's a, that is good advice to seek mentors, but the strategy you have behind actually finding those mentors and getting them to say yes, I do want to mentor you. Yeah. Is, is something that people should really examine a little bit closer. Well, yeah. how you got a mentor with Robert Greene is a perfect example of how you added value. 
Yeah, and I, by the way, was working for a lower, like a different author who is lower in the author hierarchy, and that was my in to Robert. And so that's the other thing. It's like people are, yeah, people are like, hey, Warren Buffett, can I be your apprentice? And he's like, what? <laughs> like, you know, like. Uh, it didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like, no, you got to meet, you reach out to a local stockbroker who's like friends with your parents. So, you know, like you have to start so far low on the chain and you move your way up. Exactly. Last thing I want to talk to you about. I thought I was a voracious reader until I saw how much you read. Then I felt bad about myself. It was like, it was like I was doing job. a comparison. Of course. But still, okay. Pe there's a lot of people that write into this show and they talk about reading and they want book recommendations. And Lauren and I love to read. They say, well, I don't have time to read. Yeah. Last two cents on finding time to read, because I think people should sure. hear this from your mouth. Well, look, I have an advantage in that I am paid to read books. And yep. if I don't read books, I can't write books. So I, it's it's different. Like people go, how, how can I read? As, well, you could become a prof it's like, how does uh, you know, how does this baseball player spend so much time at batting practice? It's like his whole life is designed to make that the main thing. So that's a little different. Um, I have like a couple things. So one, I decide that it's really important and that it's going to have it. I, it, I take it as self-evident that there's an ROI to reading. This isn't like a thing I do for fun. This is an investment in myself and in my education. So that, that's one thing. Um, that applies to everybody though. Yeah, everybody. of course. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. But, but you have to decide that like, I'm not reading because smart people said I should read. I'm reading because I get something out of books that I read. That's a really important one. Um, one of the things that I, I do is like uh, I'm more of like a binge reader than a regular reader. So um, like, yeah, I read the calendar of wisdom every day. I, I do try to read all the time. But like like I read, you know, 300 pages of this book on my flight from L.A. to New York or New York to L.A. yesterday. Is that about MacArthur? Uh, yes, it's mm -hmm. very good. But uh but the, the point is, like, I read and I don't I don't watch movies on airplanes. You know, I uh, I read books or, you know, uh, when I'm sitting in a car, I'm reading a book or or, you know, you're listening to audiobooks during your commute. How can you find dead time that you can turn into reading time? I think that's a. So you're not just, you know, you're just not, not sitting around sucking on your tooth. You're actually, you know. Yes. Is that an expression? <laughs> That's what I always joke around. <laughs> when, you know, like you see those people on the plane. Yes. These people are fucked up. Yeah. Right? And, and I'm sorry. Like they're just staring. They're just staring yeah. at the seat in front. What do you, what, what do, you do? I mean, listen, unless you're yeah. in a four-hour meditation. Okay, yeah. fine. Is, is stillness or is reading stillness? It can be. Okay. I think it can be. Okay. Uh, it depends. I mean, I think it depends. But for me, it's a meditative, quiet experience that's sort of transporting me to another world. So, um so yeah. your tooth is a good saying, huh? Yeah, I've never heard that before. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just I, and and I so I ma I make it a priority. And then the other thing is like, um, uh, I I I collect books. Like when I see a book and it looks good, I buy. It. Like that goes to the ROI point. Like I don't. People go like, I'm thinking about buying your book, and it's like I've never thought about <laughs> buying a book. Like I buy I buy the book if I think it's if I think yes. it's good, uh, I buy it. Oh my god. Um, it, I'm not. I've spent. <laughs> A lot of money on it and I, at one point i was spending all my money on it but um you know that's how i got where i got you did I, okay yeah it worked it worked out but i'm not i'm not like people go oh, maybe i'll buy that when it comes out on paperback i'm not gonna wait 18 months to save three dollars on a book that could change my life like you got to decide like this is important and and you know we talked about uh watching the news it's like decide you're gonna watch less news and you're not gonna be caught up with you know the the newest Netflix show, but you're gonna you're gonna read. Yeah. Lauren? Book, podcast, or resource that you would recommend to our audience that you consume. Oh, um, okay, that I consume. So I really like Tyler Cowen. Uh, his his podcast is amazing. It's a little nerdy, but it's very I check good. Check it out. What I, is is it called, Tyler Cowen? It's, I think it's called Conversations with Tyler. Okay. I like his a lot. I like uh, Rich Roll a lot. Um, let me see who else. Let me see what else yeah, I got on my phone. Feel free to go through your phone uh, and I tell will, us six specifics. What do I like? Um, and he's, his book right now on the table is called American Caesar, which yeah. Michael is already ordering in his brain right now. I know him so well. <laughs> I like uh, I like Josh Peck's podcast. I like uh, Finding Mastery with Michael Gervais. Oh, he's good. Yeah. Uh, Mike has been on the show. Yeah. I like um, Art of Manliness. I like Dr. Drew. Lance Armstrong's podcast is very good. You know, Dr. Drew came on here and said really nice things about you. Did he? Yeah. Oh, he's the best. He's a cool guy. Um, Brian Koppelman's is good. Did you listen to the Neil Strauss one, To Live and Die in L.A.? I have not. Oh, my God. It's fucking unreal. It's so good. 
uh, you know what? I got to listen to more podcasts, but maybe you're like this because I'm so in sure, the world sure. now. I find myself in a, it, before I got so inundated in the podcast world yeah. and like managing all these shows. Of but now that I'm in it, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, but l- you got to set time aside. Like he said, he, for his job is to read. You got to listen to podcasts. I like uh, Mark Maron and then I like Pete Holmes. Uh, those are ones that I those are podcasts that I like. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, books. Oh, books. I, it's Calendar of Wisdom. That would okay. be a big one. Okay. Uh, Daily Dad. I'll give a plug to Daily Dad again. You check that out. Um, what else am I? What else am I liking recently? Um, I don't know. Don't you have an email newsletter that recommends books? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, on my, on my site, I recommend books once a month. Um, but I mostly, I mostly read physical books. I don't do, I don't really do Audible, and I don't do eBooks. I want to have like physical books that I can own and write in and uh use but and i have to give a shout out to the daily stoic because not only do you have the book you have a newsletter that you do yeah, the, the email i i love the email you get yeah. the email so if you don't have time to do your stoicism in the morning you get the email and it's just a little dose of it yeah so like the book's been out almost four years this is i've basically written four additional free books because <laughs> uh, i write the you know i do the the email every day so there's just like hundreds of thousands of words of, of free content that have gone out uh so I like that. Yeah. Pimp yourself out. Tell us where everyone can find your book. Yeah. So What's stillness next? is the key should be everywhere. Uh, books are sold. Uh, I'm at Ryan holiday. I'm pretty much everywhere. And then at daily stoic is also pretty much everywhere. And there's a podcast version of daily stoic also. I didn't Did you know, know that. You check yeah. It out. yeah. That's what I was saying. I'll listen to that one. Yeah. Wait, yeah. hold on that you host. No, no. I just read the email every day. So you can just listen to the email. It's like oh, two minutes. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, awesome. I didn't want to do an interview because po- this goes to what we're talking about earlier. I want to go like, it's what do a I? Lot of work. What, yeah, what do I want to spend my time yeah. doing? What's like the main thing for me? And so, like, I've just talked to a lot of writers who are like, I don't have time to write anymore because I'm doing a podcast. So I didn't want that, but it takes me, you know, five minutes to read the email, so I read them, and then rec- it's all batched and it just happens. But um, I, I think one of the things you have to realize as a content creator is not everyone consumes in your preferred medium. So like I it's love really hardcover books, but like 30% of the sales are on Audible. You know, like I love reading articles, but some people like uh, podcasts. So you got to you got to pick. You got to be willing to meet people where they are. And I imagine with your, it's like, you're you built it mostly on Instagram, but hey, now TikTok is big, and now you got to do this, and that's just like you can't be precious about where you do your work. Totally. And I also think that's really genius that you're doing the podcast because it also saves people time. They're on the go. They maybe just want to listen to a little dose every day. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show at Ryan Holiday on Instagram, guys. Come back anytime. I'm sure your next book will be out soon. (laughs) I hope not. He's already planning it. Yeah. (laughs) Come back anytime. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan.